breakfast. Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink. When it comes to the world of comics, there are certain publishers whose work is held in the highest regard. While trends come and go, and niche players wax and wane, these publishers are seemingly evergreen, the meter unchanged when it comes to fan adoration and critical praise. Indeed, the passing of time only makes their treasures grow brighter, casting other efforts in pale afterglow. Few houses can make that claim quite like EC Comics, whose impact reverberates through the medium to this day. Founded in 1944 by Maxwell Gaines, EC sprang from humble origins. The initials EC initially stood for the term educational comics, with Gaines publishing titles such as Picture Stories from the Bible. In 1947, the unexpected occurred with the elder Gaines being killed in a boating accident, leaving his son William in charge. Bill stuck with his dad's approach at first, but soon branched out. With some of the most talented creators in the industry working under one roof, a sort of comics renaissance occurred, this chance combination of elements providing unbelievably explosive results. Crime. War. Humor. It seemed that there was no genre that EC couldn't immediately elevate by throwing its hat into the ring. However, it was the company's horror titles that drew the most attention, both then and now. There was just something about those books, a sort of lightning in the bottle quality that many have attempted to recapture but have ultimately failed. There is an atmosphere, a persevering feeling of omnipresent and anxiety and dread to an EC horror comic. Unlike modern comic companies whose identity is based on a string of recognizable intellectual properties, EC horrors are united by their grim tone and dark humor. Be they your standard garden variety vampires, werewolves, and ghouls, or something closer to home like vengeful spouses or jealous business partners, EC spooks were united in their desire for retribution and vengeance. The bloodier, the better. And while Tales from the Crypt usually gets the bulk of love from folks because of its multiple TV and film adaptations, The Vault of Horror is no small potatoes either. Today we're looking at three issues. And we're going to start with this first horror-fying issue. Hey, don't blame me, I didn't write it. Now you'll note that these books are all reprints. While I have a few tattered ECs in the archive, for the purposes of this review, we'll use these freshly cleaned up copies. They're brighter, cleaner, and I don't have to bend up my comics to make the scans. In Portrait in Wax, two starting artist types struggle to survive in 1930s Paris. Robert here is the talented one, while his roommate Henry is the jealous type. Instead of selling his potentially valuable etchings, Robert stashes them away. Tired of poverty, Henry decides to swipe one of the etchings, selling it to an art dealer across town. Impressed by the quality of the work, the dealer offers to buy more, but only on an exclusive basis. Robert agrees, but Henry catches wind and confronts his roommate over the theft. Unwilling to face the music, Robert impulsively dashes a jar of acid in Henry's face, seemingly killing him in the process. Using what he thinks is a vat of the same acid in the basement, Robert disposes of his roommate's body. With that, he begins living the high life, profiting immensely off of the dead man's art. 
However, this runs out all too soon, and bereft of the talent to produce more, the murderer is forced to think up a new scheme. Shortly thereafter, he gets word a colleague has died, and a local sculptor has produced a statue of the dead man in tribute. Robert goes to investigate and is shocked by how lifelike the statue appears. It seems this is the new scam that he's been waiting for. Robert proposes opening a wax museum with the strange old artist, who surprisingly agrees, but only under two curious conditions. Soon the museum opens and proves to be a rousing success. Robert appears to be back in the high life, but a chance encounter with one of his partner's statues reveals the startling truth. The reason the statues look so lifelike is because they are corpses encased in wax. Confronting the artist, Robert rages, but the strange little man only laughs. Falling back on his violent tendencies, Robert attacks the artist, only to discover the grim truth. His partner is, in fact, his once thought to be dead roommate, Henry, playing the long game. Robert dies of shock, but a fitting tribute unexpectedly appears, ensuring he will not soon be forgotten. The werewolf legend concerns Walter Mallory, an Englishman believed to be suffering the curse of lycanthropy. By the light of the moon, he is transformed, setting upon this unwary victim. Overtaken by this savage incident, Mallory's mind goes blank. He wakes up the next day and grapples with the truth of what he appears to have done. Summoned to breakfast, Mallory meets with his brother, Sir Gregory. Our protagonist is unnerved by the news of the dead man found on the moors. Suddenly unwell, Mallory heads off to the library to recover, where he chances upon an ancient manuscript. He learns of the curse that afflicts his family, troublesome anecdotes that end in bloodshed. To Mallory's shock, he discovers he is read far into the night, and now the full moon has risen. He blacks out, awakening once again as the werewolf. Mallory races through the moldering pile, off into the cool night air. Finding fresh prey, the beast stalks the unlucky victim across the moors before once again falling into a fugue state, waking only after the man is dead. Convinced of his guilt, Mallory goes to the police and explains the murders are the work of a werewolf. Instead of laughing at the seemingly ridiculous claim, the police inspector instead listens to Mallory's strange theory, agreeing to station men outside of the house that night. Convinced the police will shoot him and end the cycle of horror, Mallory goes to bed. However, instead of waking up dead, he rises as usual the next morning. Certain the police have failed, Mallory decides to shoot himself, stopped only at the last moment by the inspector. Turns out Mallory isn't a werewolf after all, but instead his hypnotist brother's Patsy in committing a series of murders. Whew! Isn't that always the way? Terror Train is the final tale in this Tremblerific issue. It all started the day Gloria ran away from Ralph. See, Gloria is sure old Ralphie here is fixin' to kill her. Geez, can't a guy buy a jar of poison without everyone getting all suspicious? Gloria makes her way from the cab to the train station, convinced Ralph is tailing her. Going over the events again in her mind, she is certain she is in peril, and hustles her way onto the train. As it pulls out of the station, she's convinced she sees her tormentor on the platform and leaves her car. Heading to the bar for a drink, Gloria mistakes a fellow traveler for Ralph and hurries off. She takes an empty seat and drifts away, but is awakened by the ticket taker. Having left her ticket in the first car, Gloria heads back through the train. Returned to her berth, she passes out, once again flashing back to more memories of her potential killer. She wakes to the sound of a scream and hurries to the porter's booth, only to find an icy corpse. Desperate, Gloria seeks help, but every berth she opens reveals another dead passenger. 
As the train slows at a crossing, Gloria leaps from the car, making her way to a nearby farmhouse. Shaken by what appears to be a grave, she heads inside, only to find her greatest fear realized. Ralph is waiting. We watch in mute horror as Gloria is attacked, subdued, and then nailed into a coffin, which Ralph then drags outside into the waiting grave. Gloria completely loses it, breaking down in hysterics, only it turns out the whole thing was all in her head. Seems that she's just a garden variety lunatic. Nothing spooky to see here, folks. Pretty nutball stuff. But that is, in part, why these comics possess the power and reputation that they do. Their over-the-top nature makes something that would otherwise be merely grisly or in bad taste instead a nuanced and absurdist take on the subject matter. For all that, it wasn't always peaches and cake for Bill and the gang. For all of their innovations, EC Comics are equally notable for the role they played in the establishment of the Comics Code. In short, the Code was established by the comics industry in 1954 to self-regulate the content of their comics, which had come under close scrutiny. EC Comics in particular were noted for their objectionable nature, with many of the publisher's books being used as examples of this problematic literature. The code would provide an ignoble end to the company's horror line, but at the time of publishing this issue, well, the shit had yet to truly hit the fan. Next up, it's Horror House, written and illustrated by EC mainstay Johnny Craig. In Horror House, we meet writer Henry Davidson. His work is good, but it's always late, due to the creator's unconventional lifestyle. Seems Henry is the life of the party, with folks seeking out his pad for their little impromptu soirees. And hey, here's the gang now. They're the fun-loving types, what with the liquor and jazz records and reefers and all. For all that, our boy decides he needs to get some work done. He takes it upon himself to split for a little peace and quiet, heading upstate, away from all the hubbub. On a whim, Henry buys the old Milford Manor. Its haunted reputation will keep the spectators away, and maybe even enhance his own work. Soon enough, Henry has cranked out a literary masterpiece, but this piece is short-lived. Looks like the gang has found him. They plead with their pal to return to the city with them, but Henry ain't having it. He likes living a productive life and leaves the gang to hand-deliver his latest manuscript to his publisher. The group gets the idea to spook their pal out of his new digs and crafts a Scooby-Doo-esque plan involving sound effects and props. They appear to depart, leaving Henry a note explaining that his new house is haunted. At first, the writer laughs this off, but is slowly convinced by the strange events which begin to occur around him. The sight of a ghost is enough to drive him away, but he returns shortly after with the cops, who make a terrifying discovery. It quickly becomes clear it was the gang pranking Henry, but what is unclear is what occurred after the writer left the house. One by one the bodies are discovered, each afflicted by some unknown terror. Shaken, Henry returns to the city, now content to host all of the parties, as long as it keeps the spooks away. Terror in the swamp begins deep in the murky and mysterious Okefenokee, where two men rafting are beckoned ashore by a strange old man. The codger explains that if the pair proceed, they will be killed by the strange forces that dwell within. Only he might guide them through the treacherous swamp. The two men are justifiably suspicious, but agree to return to the old codger's shack to hear his story. There, he tells the men how, thirty-five years ago, three scientists entered the swamp to perform their experiments unseen. There, they sought to create life itself using protoplasm. However, there was an X factor they'd yet to isolate, an unknown catalyst that eluded them. 
Theorizing an electric shock might do the trick, the trio slowly began zapping the protoplasm, steadily increasing the voltage and means of exposure, but nothing doing. Enraged, the professor threw the batch through the window and into the swamp, where the miraculous occurred. Slowly, the protoplasm came to startling life, incubating in the swamp's ideal conditions. Soon enough, it was eating alligators whole and having a grand old time, but all was not well. It was then young Robert chose to leave the swamp, determined to get out while the getting was good. As he leaves, an abrupt scream turns his head. Now grown to enormous size, the protoplasm threatened to consume the house itself. The professor and his daughter attempted to flee, but were helplessly drawn into the freakish beast, quickly vanishing into the rippling mass. Unimpressed by the old codger's tale, the two men head off, determined to press on. And this being a horror comic, well, let's just say that they never made it to the Waffle House on the other side. We're going to wrap things up with issue number six. Now, this was a real treat because I discovered it contained a few stories that I had read decades ago as a kid in a tattered old paperback. And while that book was nifty for what it was, its rejiggered panels and black and white presentation pales in comparison to the layouts and colors of the tales as they were meant to be seen. But hey, enough of my balloon juice. Let's get right to it. In Whirlpool, we encounter our nameless protagonist at wit's end. She is tormented by a trio of terrifying creatures who demand to know her name. Sadly, that information is unavailable to her, her mind in savage disarray. In a panic, she bolts, leaping through a nearby window. Seemingly free, she runs down an unrecognized street, the visions in her mind driving her onward. Ascending a flight of stairs, she rushes to the landing and charges through the door, but, instead of salvation, finds herself tumbling through a shadowy void. Suddenly no longer falling, she is instead brutally manhandled by this shock-eyed brute who lifts her in his powerful arms to dash her into scalding water. She burns, unable to escape, eventually pulled from the bubbling solution, her skin red and raw. She is then immersed in ice, numbing her stunned senses into submission. Now bound, she is menaced by a needle-wielding crone, drawing closer to her heart. Then, like that, it is over. A handsome man takes her from this place, leads her to a chair where she can sit and rest. Only then the manacles fall, and the helmet drops upon her head. Thousands of volts slam through her body, sending her from the chair to the cold, unyielding floor. She struggles to her feet, rising, but as she does, the walls begin to close in. Nearer and nearer they draw, threatening to crush her. And then, suddenly, she is free. Long moments pass, and a kindly figure leads her from this place. She's taken before three men, who inform her that she is, in fact, mentally ill. However, they can help her if she'll let them. They explain her recent experiences have all been delusions based on her disordered mind, and that she is, in fact, in an insane asylum. The news has an unexpected effect, as the woman's perspective suddenly shifts to madness, the once helpful doctors transforming into gibbering horrors. Unable to repeat the cycle again, the nameless woman runs, once more plunging through the window glass and into the waiting abyss. In Out of His Head, we meet hunters Stanley and Alex. Soup's on, but for Stanley, it's a meal he will never get to enjoy. Seems Alex has plunged a cleaver into his companion's bald noggin, but instead of dropping dead straight away, Stanley just kind of hunkers there, staring at his murderer with glassy eyes. Alex turns from the horror as the corpse finally submits to the forces of inertia, landing with a thud on the cold, hard ground of the forest. With that, Alex abandons the body and heads back to the city, discarding his weapons and bloody clothing along the way. We discover the crime is premeditated, Alex having taken great pains to establish an alibi for himself. Sneaking back into his apartment, he receives a mind-rending shock. 
Stanley stands just outside of his balcony doors, the metal cleaver gleaming in the moonlight. Alex loses it and screams, closing his eyes. When he opens them, the vision has passed, but the nightmare is far from over. For Stanley is now in his room again, staring at Alex accusingly. Once again, Alex closes his eyes, and again the vision vanishes. Now desperate, Alex dresses and prepares to leave, but is interrupted by room service bringing up his meal. And here's Stanley, taking up the rear, his face frozen in the grinning rictus of death. What follows is a swirling sarabande of madness as the corpse appears again and again, driving Alex to desperation. Every time he opens his eyes, he sees his victim growing closer, ever closer. Even a blindfold can't stop the terrifying visions, easily thwarted by the ever-scheming Stanley. There's only one thing for it. Blinding himself with an ice pick, Alex plunges into a catatonic state, reviving later in a hospital. Only, to his horror, the doctors have managed to restore his eyesight, a fact with unintended consequences. Alex hurls himself through a window and to the sweet embrace of death below, much to the doctor's amazement. Some guys will do anything to get out of paying a bill. Next up, it's an ample sample, and with a title like that, you just know it's going to be sweet. Here's Irwin returning some tools he'd borrowed earlier in the evening. He's just finished making something his neighbor has got to see, and in spite of the late hour, old Bert agrees. He invites Irwin inside as he dresses, asking about Irwin's wife Hannah in the process. This shakes Irwin, who clearly isn't himself tonight. After a moment, the man haltingly begins to explain what's going on. It all started off so perfectly. Years ago, his wife was... different. Turns out she was thin. Homely, but thin. But hey, that was okay, as Irwin was no prize either. In spite of financial hardship, the two marry, but things are off to a shaky start from the jump. Seems Hannah has a sweet tooth, but candy simply isn't in the budget. Irwin pleads with his wife to rein it in, but a few days later, Hannah has bought more chocolates. This time, it's a Whitman sampler box, a concept she's clearly taken with. Hey, no more guesswork. Irwin is shaken down to his tatty socks by this revelation. Turns out hungry Hannah is eating them out of house and home. Things continue to go downhill, the only bright spot in Irwin's life being his new neighbor, Bert, who's on a diet. Seven years into the marriage, and Irwin still can't save up enough for a new jacket. He pleads with Hannah, but she simply pops another chocolate. Then the breaking point occurs. Keeping his raise a secret from his wife, Irwin stashes the cash until he can afford a fresh suit, but the little woman finds it and promptly drops all $25 on more sampler boxes. This seems to unhinge our boy Irwin, who recounts his tale of woe on Bert's couch. Growing uneasy, the neighbor follows Irwin back to his home to see his handiwork. And, hey, say what you will, but that's some damn fine craftsmanship. Oh, and I recommend the forearm fudge combination. It can't be beat. Pretty grim, huh? Or was it? In spite of the dark tone and bloodshed, why, there's a wry and mischievous undercurrent running through it all. I get the sense that the creators were looking at the world around them and laughing at the thought that their cornball little horror stories were something to be worried about when the impending threat of war and atomic holocaust loomed over their very heads. Their stories were absurd asides, reflexive reactions to a world changing so rapidly one had little choice but to let go of the past and hang on for dear life. The idea that comic books were somehow the problem when very real issues like social and economic inequity were creating such havoc and instability in people's lives seems laughable, but one thing we learn from EC Comics is that the guilty are always looking for a patsy. Make sure that it's not you. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this program, please consider purchasing a mug, a t-shirt, or one of the other fine items that you can only find at the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics swag shop. 
I'm Jason Mink. I'd like to wish you a happy Halloween, and I hope to see you next Sunday at breakfast.